Today's show is brought to you by Delicious Obsessions. Real food, real life, and real delicious. Deliciousobsessions.com. You're listening to the Mountain Woman Radio Show, which can be found on our website at treyerwilderness.com and also on iTunes. Welcome to the Mountain Woman Radio Show, where we are homesteading traditionally 100% off-grid today and offering preparedness and survival tips for tomorrow. Here's your host, Tammy Treyer. Welcome, everyone. Thanks so much for joining me today. It is another hot day here in northern Idaho, but our mornings have been very cold. We had a 38-degree temperature the other day, so we did get our hoops up on the garden and are prepared for it at least this year. Garden's looking great. Things are coming along here. This is that time of year where we've got a zillion and a gazillion projects going on and shuffling from one to the other. We're getting our firewood in and with it being so dry we have to be really careful out here it's just been such a dry season and we've been very thankful so far not to have to worry about forest fires so keeping our fingers crossed there and saying some prayers and i wanted to offer all of you listening my new ebook if you didn't hear on the last show on the 15th of july i officially became a published author and the treyer wilderness cookbook homesteading the traditional way volume one is available on our website for sale, but for those of you that join our newsletter and become newsletter subscribers, you will receive a copy of that for free. And in there I talk about um, specialty diets, gluten-free and uh, dairy-free diet, uh, using essential oils in your cooking and baking, how to use a sun oven to cook your food, and include a lot of my tips and tricks. And the recipes are all uh, both regular recipes and uh gluten-free and dairy-free recipes. So I'm hoping that it'll be a benefit to many. And uh, again, go to treyerwilderness.com and get that for yourself for free. I'm really excited to have a really awesome guest today. Uh, Greg Carter is joining me today. He is from theruraleconomist.com and he is a good friend. We've been working together for several years and we are just so like-minded and I am just very blessed to know he and his family and also very blessed to have him join me today. He's a wealth of information and has a lot to share. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Greg. Greg, thank you so, so much for joining me. It is an honor and a privilege. <laughs> I'm so glad to have you on. He and I did a lot of shuffling with our, well, mainly my schedule. We had internet issues and vehicle issues, and poor Greg got put off a couple times here, but I'm so glad to have him joining me today. <laughs> But like I said, oh, that's absolutely fine. <laughs> well, I'm thankful that you were patient with me. And Greg, like I said, he has so many things to offer. And I'm just going to open the floor up to you, Greg. I'd love for you to share your story, how you got started, and your passions, and, and what you do on your homestead. Okay. Well, um, you could almost say that I got started from the womb. Um <laughs> I grew up on what we would now call a homestead or a farmstead. Okay. Um, where I grew up, it was my grandfather and my grandmother's house, my aunt and uncle's house, then our house, and then my other aunt and uncle's house. We were right in a row. <laughs> and every year, we gardened 11 acres. Awesome. Um, so... Um, we always had cows or pigs or chickens or any combination of the above the whole time that I was growing up. So um, I grew up like people did Sarah, uh, over a generation before I was born. Um, I'm one of the few people my age that has plowed a mule, that's plowed a team of horses, that's plowed a team of oxen. Mm-hmm. You know that's that's done a lot of these things, and 
and my grandfather was incredibly responsible for the man that I turned out today. Um, my dad worked a lot of hours. He was gone a lot. So my grandfather just kind of took me under his wing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, what we would do, we hunted and fished and everything. And every time we walked through the woods or through a pasture or a field or whatever, um, he would pick up something and say, here, boy, eat this <laughs> or whatever. And, and he, you know, I, when we were talking earlier, you said share your passions and foraging is one of my passions. And, and I've just, I've reconnected with it. I let it go for a while. Um, but I love teaching people about, you know what that plant is? That's this. It does this. It tastes like this, mm -hmm. you know, um, and that's something that's really good. Um, my wife and I, um, we, I went through the 2011 tornadoes, destroyed a business that I owned. Mm -hmm. I lost almost everything that I owned. Mm -hmm. Everything that was stored at the business that wasn't in one room was gone. Wow. Um, there are still times that I'll be going, well, I, just worked, I know I've got this thing, and then I'll remember that I haven't seen it since then. Oh, jeez. Um, <laughs> I've. There's there's probably stuff of mine in Georgia, and I'm in Alabama. Oh. So um, that's what really kind of kicked me back into the prepper mentality. Yeah. Um, but my my grandfather again was a prepper before there was ever a word prepper. Exactly. Um, <laughs> because that was just his way of life. Mm -hmm. yep. Um, as far as the blog, the blog actually got started on a dare. Um, we were out here and my youngest son, some of his friends were around <laughs> and, um, that on the ground, there was a plant called wood sorrel okay. for those in the Southeast. Actually, most of the U S it's also known as sour grass. Okay. Yep. And I picked it up and I started chewing on it and I handed it to them. And they're like, what is that? You can eat that. Oh yeah. You can eat it. Sure can. High vitamin C. Da, 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 da. And they said, why don't you start a blog about that stuff? I'm like, what's a blog? <laughs> that was my first question. <laughs> so um, after I figured it out and, and started learning, I started a blog. And um, the reason it's called The Rural Economist is actually economics is one of my hobbies. It's uh, I had some really good teachers in college. And... Um, I really enjoyed the subject of economics. Now, I know that labels me as a nerd right off the bat. <laughs> um, but I am of the opinion that the more information that I have about anything and everything, mm -hmm. the better off I am. Yep. Well, on our little homestead here, we are what I would call semi-rural. We're actually inside the, if you want to call it, city limits of a town of 13, 1,308. <laughs> but we can have chickens. We can have pigs. We can have goats. We can have anything we want. We can have any kind of garden we want. There's no restrictions. Everybody around us has some kind of critter. Awesome. So we've got... Some of the modern conveniences within three minutes, but we're far enough out. We're in a rural enough community, an agrarian enough community, where nobody raises an eyebrow if I want to put up kiwis or if I want to have a goat or whatever I want to do. Nobody bats a night twice. Right. <laughs> so that's good. Now, you know, goals are to eventually move to a little bit bigger place. I would like to have somewhere between five and ten acres. I think five and ten acres, unless you have dedicated woodlands, is about as much as one family can actively maintain and do a good job of it. Yeah. Nice. So um, that's kind of where we are. We have a garden. We can. We dehydrate. We do everything that we can. Awesome. Awesome. And 
growing up that way is just so priceless. It's in your roots. It's like it draws you back, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the, one of the benefits of growing up that way is I never had any of the preconceptions. Right. Um, it was never an issue for me to slaughter a chicken. Because right. I've done it since I was six. Yep. <laughs> yep. Um, you know, it's never been an issue for me for a hog killing because we did one every year when I was growing up. My first job was just keeping the fire underneath the scalding pot to scrape the hair off the yep. off the hide. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and then I graduated to stir in the lard pot. You know, and you just. You learn your jobs and you go on and, and it becomes, you don't become callous to it because you're not doing it every day, but you realize, you know what, yeah, I know this is gruesome and I know I know everything that's involved with it, but I know this is actually what is required for our family to be able to eat the things that we want to eat. Yep, yep, yeah, a life skill. Um, there was... Yeah, there was never, uh, in anybody in our family, there was never a, a, a thought that meat just magically appeared in the grocery store on <laughs> styrofoam b boards with uh, shrink wrap around them. Yep, exactly. So. And it's sad because that is a misconception by society today that our food only comes from the grocery store. And, you know, there are so many people that really don't understand where our food comes from and why you would have a chicken. So I think it's so important for right. people like you and I to be sharing and educating on that information for certain. And I am glad that you took up the bet and started your blog because it is a great asset to the community and to the Internet. So, <laughs> Well, I try. My blog is kind of all over the place. As is ours. And, uh, you know, <laughs> yes, um, we're actually quite similar. But, I mean, you know that a lot of people, they focus in on one area. Right. You know, they, they focus solely on chickens or whatever. Right. But I'm going to write about whatever's on my mind at the time. <laughs> yes. And it's going to be from a backwoods boy with an education's point of view. Yep, yep. I kind of go by divine intervention because I feel that God just shoves those ideas in my head and I just roll with it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> now, you had mentioned something else that um, I wanted to go back to. You said about the prepper mindset and that your grandfather viewed it as a lifestyle. And I think that's so key because, you know, we too out here on our homestead could be considered preppers. You know, uh, we have... We, we cross over so much, but in our mind, right. we grew up and it was a lifestyle thing. You know, neither one of us knew any different than to have a full canning shelf and to have all your raw ingredients in abundance. And, you know, like you said, to butcher the chickens and to do all those things and not think twice about it. So it that's how we speak about it, too, that it is a lifestyle thing. And I think it's really awesome that you had that opportunity to spend that time with your grandfather because I think so many people miss those opportunities to glean information from these past generations because they've got so, so much to share. Well, I, I was blessed beyond measure. Yeah. Um, I got to spend time with both of my grandfathers, yeah. my paternal and maternal. I got to spend time with three of my great-grandmothers. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. Um, so, you know, I was able to talk to people who were born in the 1800s. Oh, that's so awesome. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I really, listening to their stories, it gives you, and it's firsthand, it's not a retelling, it's firsthand, you really get a an understanding of what the world was really like. You know, my both of my grandfathers grew up during the Great Depression. Right. And and my pater, uh, maternal grandfather, we called him Paul Paul, okay. he said this statement so many times that it has been ingrained in my brain. <laughs> he said, during the Great Depression, all of the stores were full with stuff to buy. 
but nobody had any money to buy anything. Mm. He said, the next Great Depression, everybody will have money, but there'll be nothing available to buy. Mm. Wow. Powerful statement. And you can see it. Yes. You can see it. Because when they went through the Great Depression, everybody had a garden. Yeah. Everybody would trade their garden stuff for goods. Right. You know, most of the manufacturing was here. Right. Now, if we tick off the wrong country, hmm. then, you know, we've lost a lot of the consumer goods. Right. And nobody's producing much anymore in the U.S. Right. Right. So... You can see it shaping up, and, you know, I don't know if he was just using logic or if he thought he was being prophetic or, or whatever, but you can see it occurring. Yeah, yeah. And then you have those, a lot of people who are trying to grow things and raise things and and are unable because of restrictions. So it's, right. yeah, which opens up a whole other can of worms, but, you know, it's just, it's, we're in a crazy spot, so... I enjoy having people like you on my show because it touches on, on so many things where people are naive or just don't have their eyes open to sometimes. And being able to prepare and to take care of ourselves is just so important. That's why we, our families, your family, feel so driven to share because in our minds, the traditional and primitive skills are what's going to carry us forward. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If, see, the thing about it is, is at one time, if you didn't have a basic level of skills, mm -hmm. you starved to death, yep. and your family did too. Yeah. Well, we've created a society now, <laughs> and and I take just as much blame as everybody else, even though it started way before you and I were born. Right. We've we've created a society now to where, as long as you have a single skill that's sellable, or as long as you have no skills at all. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You're going to be just as good as the person in normal, as, as far as average society views it. You're going to be just as well off as a person who can weld a plow together, change the oil in a car, fix a window, kill a chicken, mm -hmm. grow a tomato, and fish without a fishing pole. Right. In fact, the person who can do all of those things is, in most areas, considered weird. Right. <laughs> I think we're considered that. <laughs> well, I know we are. <laughs> but now, I, I say that, yeah. but there's, there's a growing, there's like a, there's a creation of almost like a subculture. Yeah. Um. My job, my daytime job, has changed. Um, I work for a, a big uh, home improvement chain, national home improvement chain. Okay. And uh, I move departments, and now I'm in delivery. So I'm out on the truck. And me being me, <laughs> um, every person that I ride with or that, I, that rides with me, they're starting to learn all of these plants that they can use because I ride down the road. And I go, you see that plant right there? That's woolly moolly and that's uh, real good for asthma. And you see this and you see that and you see this. All right, well, I'm getting somebody's card and I'll, I'll see broadleaf plantain or uh, dandelions or clover or whatever. And I'll be talking to the person that, that's normally in the truck with me. And I've about 50% now go, really? That's edible or that's medicine? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yep. So um, it, it is growing. Um, but you still have a bunch of people that look at you like you've sprouted another head. <laughs> we're, we're pretty used to that look. But they – and, and yeah. our heart our heart is, is – is aching just to be able to get to those people that look at us with the six heads because we know that they're going to be the ones struggling later, you know, but it's a progressive oh, thing. Yes. It's a progressive thing and you can lead a horse to water and we're going to just keep praying you and I, that they start drinking, right? <laughs> yes. Um, I hate to say it, but there are some people that, that just, there's so much normalcy bias. Yeah. Um, 
normalcy bias means even when the sky is falling, they just look at it as a bright, sunny day. Right. That's an exaggerated definition, but it's true. Right. There's there's a lot of people, and and in a lot of it's programming. Um, yeah. Our brains are the most immaculate computer that has ever been created. Yeah. Um. But we can program it, and society can program it. And if we don't look at a situation and go, okay, I know that's what they're saying, but some reason I just don't think that's right. <laughs> right. If, if we don't start um, searching things out on our own, right. then we'll get so brainwashed that there's no hope. And there, I think I'm, I'm afraid that there's a lot of people that are so entwined in the mass media outlets and the Kardashians and whatever else is popular right now right. Um, that I don't know if for some folks there's actually going to be a turning point. Right, right. Or if their turning point will come fast enough. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Well, we're going to take a short break to hear some words from our sponsors, and we're going to come back and talk to Greg some more. He's got a lot more to share. Stay tuned. The new Pioneer Magazine, taking the skills and techniques of yesteryears and combining it with solar, hydroponics, and various other advancements of today, creating the most robust pioneering magazine on the market. In addition to the new Pioneer magazine, they also have available the American Frontiersman magazine, taking you back to a more primitive time, and both magazines can be found at newpioneermag.com. Get your copies today and be prepared for tomorrow. Do you have a loved one, or are you suffering from celiac disease or a gluten intolerance? Trying to find that perfect flour? Whether you are baking cookies, flaky pie crust, or baking breads from scratch, or you are looking for a quick cake from a package, Look no further. Better Batter offers non-GMO gluten-free products with an assortment of packaged items as well as flour packaged in varying sizes, including their bulk sizes, perfect for those of you that are practicing your preparedness skills. Better Batter is not just another gluten-free flour. It's what you have been searching for. Visit betterbetter.org. Do you have your free digital subscription to Prepare Magazine yet? If not, then hurry over to preparemag.com and start getting each monthly issue sent directly to your inbox. It's easy. All you have to do is go to preparemag.com, enter your name and email address, and you're subscribed. Consider signing up for the premium membership for past issues and exclusive resources. You can even subscribe to the beautiful print version of Prepare Magazine. Visit preparemag.com and choose the option that's most valuable to you. Prepare Magazine, encouraging, empowering, and enriching your journey. Okay, we are back, and we are talking again with Greg Carter from the RuralEconomist.com. And Greg, you've been sharing such great stuff, and I know that you have some really great things you have to share, and I want to make sure we get them in today. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about the book that you have already published, and um, I think you have something else to share about one possibly coming out also. Yes. Well, the book that I've already got out is called Micro and Cottage Business is What You Need to Know and How to Get Started. Um, it's a little bitty book. It's straight and to the point. Now, here's my deal. I am not a step-by-step -step person. I don't want somebody to give me step-by-step. -step. I want them to point me in the right direction and let me go. Um, we cover um, regulations. We cover taxes. We cover advertising. We cover some ideas for both mid and small business, micro business and, and small businesses. Now, interestingly, when I was doing the research for the book, I did not realize that a small business, according to our government, is anything under 500 employees and under $35 million in capital investment <laughs> that's not dominant in its field. That's considered a small business. Huh. Yeah, <laughs> a micro business. Yeah, a micro business is five or fewer employees. Okay. With a startup of less than fifty thousand dollars. Okay. Okay. That's what I thought a small business would be. Yeah, likewise. Okay. <laughs> a cottage business is no more than three employees, and is typically a product. Your soap. 
is a cottage business. Okay. Your husband's uh, blacksmith work. Okay. Your son's bracelets. Yeah. All of those would be considered a cottage business. Okay. A micro business can be a product that is actually dominated by services. Okay. Um, you know, some of our friends offer online classes. Um, right. Me teaching classes around here, taking people off, showing them what's edible, what's not, when when it is and when it isn't. That's considered a, a micro business. Um, so I cover. I think I've got like ten or eleven. M- m- Little or no investment ideas and like four or five middle cost business ideas. Okay. And I just go through it and it's, you know, everybody who's read it that and people that I don't know have told me it's great. It, it is a primer. Um, it's not, like I said, it's not a step by step because the steps that work in Alabama might not work in Idaho. Right. Right. Just due to regulations. Right. Right. And some, so, people, some um, people just need that starting point. You know, um, oftentimes I take for granted that we just have that mind to just embrace and go where other people don't have that and they don't see things the same way we do. So, you know, it's important for us as educators to remember to step back and think of that. So your ideas, I'm sure, are touching many people because not everybody has the mindset that we do. Right, exactly. I mean, you know, we being the way we are, Mm -hmm. if we come up with an idea, okay, I've got an idea to create, you know, oak wedges for whatever. Right. Okay. We just get started, and if we run into a roadblock or if it collapses, we just pick ourselves up, dust ourselves off, look around, and go in a different direction. (laughs) Um, And that's just, that's part of the pioneer spirit, I think. Yeah. Because, you know, um, our parents and our our grandparents and our great-grandparents, you know, they would just try something. And if it didn't work, okay. And if it did, great. I'll remember that. Yep. Yeah. Um, but we, we've we've gotten to a point where a lot of us are so afraid to fail yeah. that we won't try anything. I know so many people like that. They think themselves to death. They think themselves right out of an idea before they even bring it into any form of thought. You know, and and I think you're right with it being a pioneer spirit because you know we've watched our parents and grandparents and our families, you know, work through adversity and never skip a beat. You know. Uh, like with my my parents, both of my parents were self employed, and you know you just it was just a a, a natural day to day thing, you know, to just keep improvising, you know. So it's just it's funny when you look back and realize how you became the way you are, you know, because I view things so differently. You know, adversity and and hiccups are just a little skipping the road it's not even a bump anymore you know you just yeah. i chuckle anymore my husband thinks i'm nuts i laugh when we have things break because i'm like well something good's gonna come out of this it'll get fixed somehow we'll fix that you're gonna rig something up and <laughs> you know it's just it's- well exactly um i don't remember there was a book that i read as a teenager where the hero when they, and it was um i don't know medieval fantasy something something But the hero, every time he went into battle, whenever the battle looked the worst, he would start laughing. (laughs) Yep. And that would nerve his enemy to the point where a lot of times his laughter would be the turning point of the battle. (laughs) I wish I could remember which book it was in. But that is so true. Yeah. Well, it's either laugh or, if, laugh or cry, you know, sometimes. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it is. And sometimes it's both mixed together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but just the ability to go, you know what? I'm going to march through this calamity, mm-hmm. and I'm going to laugh, and I'm going to smile the whole way through. Mm-hmm. And... 
everybody, everybody who sees what's going on, it changes their perception of you instantly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're either going to think that we are a fighter and someone who perseveres or just think we're absolutely nuts. But <laughs> but it's either one of them. They're going to give you a wide berth. <laughs> It's a good coping mechanism in my eyes because, you know, you can't, you cannot work through adversity when you're angered and frustrated because it just makes it worse. So, you know, being able to just embrace it. And like you said, with that book, you know, fighting the enemy, sometimes I think, you know, the the devil takes those great opportunities to just entwine in your family and, and wreak havoc when you've got you know, struggles going on where if you just stomp him back down where he belongs and keep going, it's so much better. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. Well, I want to give you the opportunity to talk about your other book, too, because that is up and coming. And I yes. Would... So share, share some about that. Okay. It um, should be. I am in the final stages of getting everything ready. It should be published and released by September. Um, it is called um, Everyday Preparedness, No Zombies Required. <laughs> it is my goal with the book is if people take the book and they do everything that I have in the book, they will be prepared for a 10-day emergency. Okay. Um, it is, you know, why prepare, Okay. We have tornadoes down here. You don't have very many up there. No. They do occur, yeah. but they're not near as common. Okay? You have blizzards. Yeah. We don't. Yep. Yeah. Okay? So everybody's got something. Yep. Yeah. Though. Everybody. Oh, absolutely. That could knock their world on its rear end for 10 days. Absolutely. Everybody. Absolutely. So by making people realize, okay... To achieve a basic level of preparedness is not being paranoid. No. Okay? A lot of folks um, look at folks who prepare as being tinfoil hat, yep. scared of everything, conspiracy theorists. Yep. But there is nothing conspiracy theorist about you preparing for a blizzard and us preparing for a tornado or a hurricane. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's part of it. I go through things like, you know, food storage, water storage, um, basic comfort, okay? You said it's hot up there in Idaho. Right. What's the t What was the high temperature today? It was 111 on the house, which means it was like 101 outside. Okay. Yep. Fair enough. All right. So down here, our heat index has been 105 to 115, <laughs> with the exception of three days for the past three weeks. I believe it. I be and humid. Okay. Don't forget to mention the humid. And, yeah. <laughs> right. Because our humidity, some days is so bad that goldfish swim by you. I believe it. There's so much water in there. I believe it. We okay. need to use the scissors when we got out of the highway on, in Pennsylvania when we returned for a visit to cut through it. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, if if the power's out for two hours right. when it's that hot, oh, yeah. everybody's miserable. <laughs> there are ways to keep yourself cool. Right. In the winter, there are ways to keep yourself warm, even if you don't have a nice wood cook stove. Yeah. Okay? Yep. So I go through some of the basics there. I, there's actually a way to keep the stuff in your fridge or in your deep freeze safe using your car. Yep. Awesome. I go through that. Awesome. Um, it's just, you know, it's just basic stuff. Do this, do this. Priorities lists. Yep. If you have to evacuate, have a plan. Yep. Have a way to communicate when communications are not available. Yep. Just walk through it. Awesome. And um, it'll be, like I said, it'll be available in September. Okay. Um, I, I've finally found the house that I'm going to use for the cover and everything. And, awesome. You, know, you've, you writing books, you know you have a picture in your brain and you're not <laughs> going to be satisfied till it looks like that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but, yeah, um, I enjoy 
communicating. Yeah. I enjoy teaching what I know, and I enjoy learning more. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, that's why, you know, like you said, we've been working together for quite some time um, before we even talked. To, you know, I subscribe to your podcast. Yeah. Um, I, I glean information from everywhere I can. Yeah. That's, and that's I cool. just, when, when I get information together, it's my job. It's, it's what I was designed to do. Yep. To share. Is share that information. Okay. I'm not happy unless I'm teaching somebody. Yep. Yep. And we feel very driven. We feel very driven to share this information. You know, we feel like we were brought here for a purpose and that that has, is a part of it. So, and, and it's, and you are such a wealth of information and you're like, I am, I, I won't, I will stop learning when I'm six feet under. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. And even then, if, uh, if I've got a microscope, I'll look at the, look at the soil and see what kind of microbes are in it. You know, <laughs> I knew where you were um, heading with that. <laughs> I love it. If, 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 as long as I'm able to learn, I'm going to learn. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Now I know that you have some things going on, upcoming too that you're going to be filming and uh, before I get there I want to mention to the audience you can go to Greg's website the rural economist.com and sign up for his newsletter that way you will know when his everyday preparedness so no zombies required is available so that you can get your hands on it because I really suggest getting it and having that and learning from that because that is uh, essential information and if you're not accustomed to being prepared that's a great start. I know Greg, and I know what he shares, and I know what he offers. So, And I will be doing a review on that on our website as well, as well as um, his first book. So stay tuned for those. But, Greg, share with us what you're going to be filming soon. Well, um, I've actually, I am, once again, blessed beyond measure. I've got three whole days off where we're going to the lake, and we're going to be hanging out, and I'm going to be recording Wild Edibles videos. I'm going to be looking around for opportunities to to do pre, uh, do things like that because just like you know, I mean, we are very similar. Yeah. Um, anytime I see something that I think, hey, I can teach on this, I'm going to take a chance. Yeah. Um, which there was there is something coming up that I forgot to mention. I am in the process of making some broadleaf plantain salve. Oh, awesome! It's a healing salve. Yep. Uh, the first part of making the extract is actually already on my YouTube channel. Okay. The second part, which as soon as I finish it, it's a little overdue due to everything being crazy. <laughs> but as soon as I finish it, I'm going to be giving away a jar of my plantain salve through my YouTube channel. Awesome. I've researched how to do a YouTube giveaway, and I'm going to be doing it. And there will only be one. And I'll be mailing it out, and it will be completely handmade by me. You can watch the video and see that I've made it myself. Awesome. So that will be coming up. Um, just There's going to be a lot of stuff going on. Um, you know, you and I both write as much as we can. Yeah. Um, I generally try to have a, we, um, uh, a co-host for a homestead blog hop on Wednesday, okay. and I generally try to have a post go live every Saturday. Um, and I cover the full gambit, homesteading, prepping, self-reliance. I've not gone on the politics thing yet. Uh, I try to avoid it <laughs> because, you know, people – People choose one side or the other, and they they point at the other side and say that they're the reason everything's wrong. Right. So I I don't I, I avoid that. So yeah, you do too. <laughs> just good, just good. Now I'm not afraid of a of a a tiff. You know, I'm I'm not afraid to cover something that's uh, talk about something that's controversial. Right. But I'm not going to choose a political side. Right. Right. Uh, so, um, just like you say, I got a lot going on and love to have everybody join me, come along for the ride. And if we go down any hills, feel free to raise your hands and say, we. 
<laughs> awesome. And just so you guys know, you can find Greg on YouTube at either youtube.com slash Rural Economist, or you can search his name, and I just want to clarify it as G-R-E-G-G, and then Carter, C-A-R-T-E-R, -E and you can find him on YouTube, but uh, definitely check him out. And Greg, we're running out of time, but I would love for you to give our audience some words of encouragement on how to maybe embrace such a lifestyle or where to begin, whatever you, whatever you feel driven to say. Okay, I'll tell I'll tell your your audience just like I tell everybody. Okay. I don't care where you live. <laughs> I don't care how much money you have. <laughs> I don't care what your past is. <laughs> I don't care about any of that. <laughs> the important thing is to get started, and it doesn't matter if it's potted herbs in your windowsill, <laughs> a bucket with a tomato out front, or you're going to plant seven rows of peas. Yep. <laughs> it doesn't matter as long as you get started. You will never achieve a dream of self-reliance, self-sufficiency, or homesteading if you don't start. Yeah, yeah, amen. That, <laughs> yep. That's pretty much it. That That's that's what I tell everybody. Well, that's awesome, and my audience has heard that before, and I'm hoping that they're listening and embracing one thing at a time, and that was awesome. And, Greg, thank you so, so very much for joining me today and sharing all that you have. It was a pleasure and an honor. <laughs> well, thank you. And, everyone, thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to spend it with me. So until next show, you guys take care, and God bless. You're listening to the Mountain Woman Radio Show, where you will learn something new every week. We hope you enjoyed the show and encourage you to join us at TreyerWilderness.com. And be sure to connect with us on iTunes. Remember, your reviews on iTunes are very important to us and help us reach more people just like you. 